This is Ed Pecky with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date is June 3rd, 2023, and I'm conducting an interview with Mr. Leonard Harrison in Reading, Pennsylvania. Sir, would you tell us, uh, give us your name, where you were born and where you, where you grew up? Good uh, afternoon. My name is Leonard Harrison. Uh, I was born in Sellersville area of Pennsylvania. Uh, I lived in the area my entire life. And what what uh, what area of war time did you uh, experience? I I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 1979. Um, I went to Paris Island for my initial recruit training. Uh, then went to infantry school at Camp Geiger, Camp Lejeune, and from there I was assigned to Weapons Company, 2nd Battalion, 6th Marine Regiment. Uh, conducted a uh, bunch of med cruises, and my final deployment was to Beirut, Lebanon, as part of the Multinational Peacekeeping Force uh, in, from January to uh, the end of June 1983, when we returned back to the States. Do you have any other military veterans in your family? Uh, my father was a Marine, and my grandfather was in the Royal Navy during the Second World War. Royal Navy? Yes. So you, you trace your roots back to, to, to England? Yes. Uh, the short story is uh, Granddad's ship was blown up. It needed repairs, went to the Philadelphia Naval Yard for repairs, and that's where the uh, American side of the family started. Okay. <laughs> 1947, he emigrated. So um, why, why did you choose to enlist in the military? Well, I really didn't feel I was mature enough to go to college. I wanted to grow up a little bit. I also felt that there was a need for uh, military service as uh, my contribution to the country. And at one point I had thought about making it a career, but primarily was uh, see the world, grow up a little bit, and have some fun. And why, did you, why, why the Marine Corps? Uh, probably because my father and other family members had been in the service, in the Marine Corps. Marine Corps. Okay. So talk about your, your, your training a little bit. You, you did your, you, what's it like? How old were you when you, when you enlisted? I was 17 years old. So a 17 year old um, going down and getting off that bus and standing on those infamous yellow footprints. What's that like? Well, going through your head. I, I'm not going to lie. I, I was scared. It was confusing, and it's meant to be that way. And uh, you just learn to adopt with it and and deal with each situation as it comes across. Um, certainly was challenging. There's no doubt. Um, I didn't think it was physically that hard, but mentally it was. And I thought our our summer football practices uh, in high school were much more conditioning. Let's put it that way. Okay. But the mental stress was obviously a lot higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, graduated, I believe, November of 1975, and immediately went to infantry school uh, at Camp Lejeune, Camp Geiger. So what, uh, when you go to infantry school, um, basically, I mean, a Marine, every Marine's a rifleman. Every Marine's a rifleman, but in my case, I was uh, a mortarman. Okay. Uh, 81 millimeter mortars and 60 millimeter mortars. Um, I was further trained as a forward observer in addition to working in the gun line and uh, was able to call in artillery fire, mortar fire, and also learn to call in airstrikes. So was being part of a mortar crew, was that, did they, was that your choice to, to go that direction or did they say, you know, you five are right, you five are going to mortars, you five are going now, to mortars? No, when, when I enlisted, I had the choice of being a straight-up rifleman, machine gunner, or mortarman, or an assaultman, and just the choice was I was put in the mortar section. Okay. What, what's, what, what's it like the first time you drop that, that mortar round down that tube? Uh, it's, it's, you, it, again, it's scary because you don't know what to expect. You know, I've never seen a, a, a mortar fired in real life, and you drop the shell down, slide your hand down the barrel, make sure it doesn't get blown off when the round comes out, and uh, there it goes, you know. You just have to, uh, whatever they tell you, whatever the charge is, adjust the number of increments on it, uh, whatever the fuse setting is. Uh, it was uh, four weeks of intense training, and we fired probably five, six hundred rounds in the course of those four weeks. Okay. Uh, so a after you complete that training, where do, where do you go to next? 
Uh, I was assigned to Weapons Company, 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines. That was at the end of December 1979. Uh, okay. um, I, most of the guys that were in my training platoon also went to uh, Weapons Company. So I had a really nice knit group of guys uh, that I served with for the next three or four years. Mm -hmm. So um, when, when's the first time you leave the country? My first overseas deployment was in June of 1980 aboard uh, USS Lemoore County, which was an LST. I was a forward ob observer for the mortar platoon assigned to Golf Company 2-6. Okay. And uh, we went all through the Middle East and uh, Mediterranean, uh, went down the o uh, Indian Ocean, crossed the equator, uh, became a shellback. And did did like uh, a training exercise every three to four weeks, different countries all over the world. Italy, Spain, uh, Israel, went through the Suez Canal, uh, Kenya, Oman, a whole whole bunch of places. It was really cool to see um, Israel and antiquity. It's just amazing. Jerusalem, where Christ was crucified, where he was buried where he was born, it was just amazing. And I would never have had that opportunity uh, <laughs> to right. do that on my own. Yeah, I mean, serving your country and doing, and doing your duty, but at the same time, you're getting these experiences that, like you said, you, you, you never would have traveled to these countries. Yeah, that you military. know, in America, things are a few hundred years old. When you're in Europe, mm -hmm. it's thousands of years, and it's just the yeah. incredible history that's on top of everything. You're walking, on, you know, literally on ancient footsteps. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, what, what, what was your, what was your feeling, and what was your impression, and how did you like being on, on, on the ship? Uh, well, shipboard life was uh, obviously you're cramped for space. You don't have any privacy. Um, the our one, the ship I was on, it's not very big. It might have held uh, 150 crew and maybe 200 Marines. There was really limited space for exercising and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and while I was on ship, I was assigned to the radio room because uh, I had a security clearance and I was able to uh, message traffic back and forth is my job during the day when I was uh, on ship until we went ashore for our training exercises. Mm -hmm. So. Were, you, were, were your training exercises, were they geared towards anything specific? Like, was there a build-up for something? Were they, did you, was there some sort of uh, commonality with each thing? Like, all right, it seems like they're building us up for something. Well, we were assigned to the 6th Fleet. We were the Amphibious Ready Group. And basically, whatever the 6th Fleet needed us for, uh, in the event that they needed to evacuate American citizens from troubled spots, uh, enter into combat or whatever was needed, that unit was available to the 6th Fleet Commander. And what was the hot spot at that time? I don't know if there was one. Um, obviously, the Middle East is always a flashpoint. Um, but we returned home, I, I believe it was in November, December of uh, 1980. Okay. And then my second deployment was um, I guess we left October 1981 and returned February or March of 1982. And the hotspot at the time, Anwar Sadat was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were uh, what they call mod lock, which they lock an area off the coast, and that's where all the battle groups formed in the event that American forces were needed to withdraw civilians or whatever, because it was a pretty chaotic time at mm -hmm. that uh, point. And we also did operations in the Sea of Mamora and the Dardanelles Straits uh, near Turkey. Uh, we, I don't know exactly what we were doing, but we were allegedly were involved in transporting nuclear weapons uh, from Insulik Air Force Base to another area of uh, Turkey. I mean, so I they say. Do, so right. they say. Right. Maybe a historian can fact check that for me to see what we actually did there. But it was pretty, pretty cool to see uh, the battlefields of Gallipoli uh, okay. from the First World War, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which were pretty amazing. Did you get out to see any of the, the World War II sites in North Africa or anywhere in that area? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, we trained a couple of times um, in the Salerno area. 
Persano was the name of the Italian training base, and that was um, for the Salerno invasion in 1943, and also areas of uh, near Rome um, in Anzio, uh, Monte Romano was the area. But again, it was just cool. We're riding down the road in our amphibious tractors, and you're passing Roman aqueducts and Roman ruins. It was just so cool. I wish I would have taken more pictures than what I did, you know? You don't think when you're a kid of 17, right. 18. Absolutely. You're just, you're just living in the you're moment. You're just living in the moment, right? Absolutely. So uh, that was your second deployment. Um, when, when, do you, when do you get over to Beirut? Well, we were in a rotation to go overseas anyway for my third med cruise. Uh, but I think the Marines started deploying to Beirut in June of 1982. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were scheduled to deploy in January, but we weren't sure if we were going to Beirut or not until like just a few months before we left. Mm -hmm. We knew we were going to Beirut. Um, we started, had more training geared toward uh, anti-mechanized warfare because the Israelis uh, had invaded uh, the Lebanon and it was really bad. The PLO, Syria was involved and we didn't know who the enemy was going to be because we we're peacekeepers and actually I had no idea what a peacekeeper does, <laughs> you know, and um, I kind of thought it was going to be like a cop, you know, you stay on that side of the road, you stay on this right. side of the road. Well, we left in January. I believe we got there uh, around February 12th or 13th, went ashore, established our positions, relieved uh, 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines. Uh, then we started doing training the Lebanese Armed Forces, conducting patrols, basically showing the flag, getting to feel the area. Uh, the area around the airport where we were stationed was a Shiite slum called Hayat Salam. And uh, these people were dirt poor. Uh, there had been several massacres uh, by Israeli-supported phalangists, um, and they were quite happy to see us there, frankly, at first. Mm -hmm. But then there was a shift, and you could feel it in the air, because uh, when you go on patrol, there would be no young men at all. Then occasionally you start seeing young men back again, like they were filtering back mm -hmm. in. And one particular incident in March of 1983, uh, terrorists threw a hand grenade at one of our patrols and five Marines in my platoon were wounded by the grenade blast. They weren't seriously hurt, but it was the uh, first use of uh, the newer flak jackets the Marine Corps had went to from the Vietnam style jacket. Mm -hmm. And other than minor injuries, they were okay. Uh, and then you could feel like it further slid into uh, chaos because there was a suicide bombing of the American Embassy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know how many Americans total were killed, but I believe 63 Americans, Lebanese, were killed and maybe 120 plus wounded. But it was pretty devastating. The entire front of the building was blown off by the suicide bomber. And I guess we got there probably within one hour of the explosion because we had to, you know, we had to form up, get a motor convoy right. ready. And basically we had to prepare to fight our way there because mm -hmm. we had no idea what to expect. And uh, again, because I had a security clearance, one of my jobs was to look for classified materials that were laying in the open. And we also were recovering uh, uh, body parts at that point. Most of the wounded had already been, you know, had got emergency treatment. Right. And uh, it was a pretty intense period of two or three weeks because uh, the battalion was short. Like one rifle company was in France on training. We had one group that went to Turkey on an R&R &R for a couple days. And normally our battalion would probably have uh, a thousand people in it. We might have had 600 at the time. So we were stretched in it, week after week, uh, patrols, the embassy. You were lucky if you got three, four hours of sleep a night. It was constant tempo that just kept going and going. And then toward the end of May, uh, there were starting to be some really heavy artillery exchanges in the mountains between uh, the Lebanese armed forces, uh, the Shiite militias, I, there's so many groups, Murabi Tune, Phalanges, it's just like every street gang in the world is in Lebanon and they have AK-47s and rocket-propelled yeah. grenades and it was just a mess and we, we would get a lot of spillover fire. Whether it was directed at us, we don't know, but fortunately not, not anybody got hurt after that point. Um, and we left... Uh, Relieved by 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, um, May 31st, 1983. 
uh, rode the ships back home, went to Key West for really good liberty, really good liberty. <laughs> and um, I was discharged in uh, July of 1983 from active duty. And um, I was then assigned to uh, Echo Company, 2nd Battalion, 25th Marines, based in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where I finished out my uh, military service. So to, to go back just a little bit, um, <coughs> back, back, back to Beirut. So there, w there was the bombing of the embassy. Yes. And then there was the bombing of the barracks. Yes. You, that, then that, that was a, a pr pretty close time frame um, to each other. Yeah. Had it, you left, had you, had you still been over there when, when, the, when the barracks were bombed? No, I was not there when the, uh, the October bombing occurred. Okay. I, I know they pulled the Marines out and, and I, what, less than a month later, they put them. They put the guys back in. That that was in 1982. That happened. Yeah. But we were pretty constant presence from that point forward. Yeah. Uh, till about 1984. Okay. I I was actually shopping for a TV set in the Sears store when I saw it on the news that the uh, what they call the BLT had been blown up, mm -hmm. and I said to my wife, I said, Sharon, there's over 400 men in that building, and we knew the casualties were going to be horrific. And coincidentally, my battalion was on air alert mm -hmm. at Camp Lejeune, and two companies and the headquarters company flew back to Beirut to replace the uh, the headquarters company that was essentially wiped out and right. provide extra uh, support. They were there for about two months before they were shipped back home. So had I stayed in the service, I probably would have went back to Beirut. Right. So when you first got there, was, was it was it still the UN that was that was over there doing the peacekeeping, or had they had they pulled out already? No, the UN was still there, but there was um, multiple groups. There was UNIFEL, there was United Nations observers, and our group was multinational force, which was the British, the Italians, and the French. Uh, roughly, maybe five thousand troops in total, including the Americans. Uh -huh. uh, Tutu Mao was. Uh, our higher headquarters, Marine Amphibious Unit. Okay. James Mead was the uh, commanding officer. Okay. So when you're over there, um, like you said, you had gotten to the embassy what, within an hour? After. Within an hour. What, what's, what's going through your mind? Well, there's confusion, it's chaos, uh, there's smoke, flame. Um, I, a lot of people don't know, but the embassy had this CS system built into it in the event that it was taken over, like the Iranians. Yep. They could flip a switch and flood it with CS gas and chase everybody out. Yeah. But when it blew up, you have all this CS cloud, which is retarding, you know, yeah. our rescue efforts. Absolutely. And then that was, that was tough. That right. was tough. And I, that's why I will always remember the stench of uh, burning flesh, CS gas, and the smoke and flame. Mm. And, and and like you said, not knowing who your enemy is. Yeah, you don't know who your enemy is. We would be on patrol, and we could be fired upon uh, in a build-up urban area. You don't know where it's coming right. from. The Israelis um, did a lot of reconnaissance by fire. They wouldn't take a chance. If they thought something was bad down the road, they would fire it up with 50 cows and small arms. And they don't care who was in the way. And I, I understand that. Yeah. Um, but occasionally we got overshots from them and we bumped into the patrols quite frequently. And that was, uh, that's your side, this is our side. Because they would blame us for the PLO and other terrorists filtering in and out, attacking them and coming into us, yeah. which may have been a safe zone to them. Right. We don't sure. know. but uh, It's hard when the lines are so blurred. Yeah, yeah. And who is the enemy? Not everybody. They're not wearing uniforms. You know, right? So, so was there that constant thought of I'm being watched by somebody? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, it was. Uh, you head on a swivel. I mean, there's no doubt. And when you would go on a patrol, you would have 12, 14 guys and a Navy corpsman, maybe, and uh, we would take out uh, grenades, uh, basic load of ammunition, um, rounds for the uh, two or three guns, and maybe a couple law rockets, and uh, just hope for the best. We would have various checkpoints we would have to tag um, on the map, and once we completed those points, we would go home. But we would never take the same route in or out. Everything okay. would be different. Right. Uh, sometimes we'd get a helicopter ride, get dropped off somewhere, and then walk back, or um, 
the coast road was a really hairy area because it was a big Palestinian area. Okay. And um, they did not like Americans. No. And like I said, there was this shift where the Christians loved us. But I think at some point, because we were trained in the Lebanese army, that they thought we were supporting the government of Lebanon okay. at their expense. Right. So I think that was a big shift. You know, I don't know all the geopolitical right. stuff that was sure. going on, but, uh, but it, 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 that's how we felt. Right. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be accurate or true if one side It's a perception, it, right. It, it, it becomes that's what it is. Because I remember on our first couple of patrols into Hooterville, what we called uh, Hail Salam, after Petticoat Junction, if you remember that show, um, the children would come up to us, and then the children stopped coming, and that was like another flags went up, you right. know. So th you know, they they were being told stay away from the Americans. Yeah, stay away. Um, and when the kids were around, you felt safer because sure. you nobody nobody's going to fire up their own children. At least you hoped. You hoped. Um, so, any any did you any direct contact with with Palestinian forces? I don't know. <laughs> you, you personally had? I I yeah. we confronted some Israeli soldiers, uh, but I don't know. I, of course, I was fired upon uh, yeah. quite a few times, but okay. who did it and did we return fire? No, we had some pretty severe restrictions on our use of force. Right. In fact, when we started patrolling, we weren't even carrying loaded magazines and our rifles. You're kidding. I am not kidding. Wow. That rule wasn't changed until after the five guys in the platoon got wounded. Right. Then we could load a magazine, but only insert a round in the chamber on command. But uh, let me tell you, that was the most disregarded order in Marine Corps history. Sure Whenever was. we went outside the wire, we locked and loaded. I mean, that's got to be it's got to be a, a you know a, a mind scramble when they say, "Hey, here's your weapon, but you don't have any ammo." I mean. Well, you had ammo, well, but you couldn't load it right. up. I mean, I mean, so what do you think when you, when they tell you this? Like, what are, are you serious? It, it's it, the rules of engagement were stupid, to put it bluntly. Right. It was a war zone. We should have been able to protect ourselves as we needed to see fit, and that was probably my biggest frustration with the whole operation. What is the point of even being there then? Right. And I'm sure you, you, and you were not the only one that held that. No. That Did I have thought. any special training for a peacekeeper? Not a lick. Right. And like you said, you didn't even know what a peacekeeper was. No, I had no idea what a peacekeeper was. You were trained to blow shit up, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> to put it bluntly, that's exactly it. A in, in an area where stuff needed to be blown up. Yeah. Yeah. So when you when you went out, and so how long were you over there in Beirut, did you say? Yeah, roughly four months. Four months. So Four months on the ground, I would say, okay. but being on ship back and forth, it was right. a total of six, seven months. Okay. So when you go out and you, you know, you, you do your, your, your rounds, your operation, where you got to hit your, your points. Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there a defined schedule to that? Like you're going to go out every three days, you're going to go out every ten days. Is, oh no, our, our um, basically we got assigned a number of patrols, which our, was our responsibility to do. Mm -hmm. uh, there were three other rifle companies. Uh, Eighty-one platoon is a very large platoon in the Marine Corps. Uh, we had one section away that was guarding the Mal headquarters, and we had three other sections that would go on patrol. So at first we were running two or three patrols a day, but then they cut it back to one long patrol. So out and back might have been between five and seven miles. Okay. So and however long it took you to Yeah, however long it took us to get done, and whatever time we would start, sometime in the morning, sometime at night, mm -hmm. you know, everything was varied. Nothing was on a set schedule. Right. Because we want to set a pattern, you sure, know what I mean? Yeah. Predictability is, yeah. you know, costly. Yes, it is. Um, so, what, when you're not out on your on the patrol, are you, are you having other duties, or is that considered your downtime? Oh no, no, we, we we had other duties. Uh, we still had the gun line. We had the guns to service, our own weapons to clean and maintain, mm -hmm. and just all manner of things there unto pertaining we would do working parties, uh, whatever. Uh, we normally had a hot breakfast in the morning. We had a cook that would come out and we had a small field kitchen. Uh, so the one cook would whip up breakfast for 80 some guys in 15 minutes, you know, just nothing special, right. eggs and bacon and toast and stuff like that, coffee. Uh, normally for uh, lunch, we would have um, a sea ration and for dinner, uh, if nothing was going on, they would bring hot chow out to us. So um, 
the the food was okay i can't complain you know food in a can is food in a can but they started those new rations uh the um the freeze dried came in a plastic bag the mres mre oh my god they were horrible okay. nobody wanted to eat those <laughs> they tasted like shit you couldn't cook them um, then they came out with some kind of heat tab so you could yeah. cook it but it was absolutely a mess i i would have rather eaten out of a can the old sea rats were yeah they, they to me they were okay um okay. they're greasy but they're filling and they get the job done right uh, i forgot this when we first got to uh the lebanon uh, about the second weekend, there was a massive snowstorm up in the mountains, and uh, we got sent up there as a rescue operation. And we took our amphibious tractors up into the mountains. Uh, I believe the area was called Kartuba, and it was like one of the worst storms that had ever happened in the Lebanon. And pe people were freezing to death in their cars. And we went up there for three or four days, uh, basically provided assistance to whatever we could do. Um, my particular section was assigned to guard an LZ, which they called LZ Soccer. And it was this heavily fortified Christian village. And the churches were like fortresses. You know, there were loopholes for firing and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And uh, it was pretty, pretty interesting to get to meet the uh, people of Lebanon versus being, this is our fence, right. that's your side. And other than being outside the wire, I didn't have any contact with uh, a Christians. Okay. Obviously, a lot of Muslims right. in, around the, the airport, but it was pretty neat to see the other side of the Lebanon. Did you find that when you were dealing with or interacting with just the, the everyday citizens who may or may not have been of military age or anything like that, were they generally accepting of you guys? Did they feel comfortable with you, or, or were they keep you at arm's length? Well, Literally. like like I said in the beginning, they were very receivable to us in the beginning, but yeah. then there was that shift. Right. And uh, I had the opportunity to visit uh, an interpreter's family uh, in Beirut, mm -hmm. and uh, they loved us. Um, he was a Muslim, okay. but, uh, you know, they, they opened their home to us. And, you know, you, you feel you're filthy. You don't get a lot of chance to shower maybe i get a shower every other day sometimes it was two weeks i didn't get it get to bathe you know and you're you're scruffy looking and you don't you don't feel presentable to meet people you right, know what i mean right right but it was probably more the fact that they were able to but but they understood sure. you know they understood they were able to accept you more in private than be public and open yes about absolutely it. absolutely For fear of you know, your retaliation yeah, or your your, your, your collaborator right, or whatever right um so, at the time, you, you had a wife at home at the time? No, I my wife was my girlfriend at okay. the time. Were you able to regularly keep in touch with back home? Well, we're at snail mail. Okay. Um, and basically would take a letter two weeks to get back and forth. Okay. Um, very infrequently, on my first appointment, I could make a phone call, but like a 20-minute call was like $50 back then, which was a lot of money because, yeah. you know, I was getting paid less than $1,000 a month, wow. I think, back yeah. then. So to go back to when you said you, the church is over there being fortified, coming from the United States where the church, it's open, it's, it's, it's majestic, now you're going over to a place where, you know, this is a place of worship, but it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's a fortress. Is, is, does that impress upon you? Do you, do you is that... Well, of course, so I, I know my history, you know, the Crusades and as far back. I right. mean, it's been conflict for centuries, and uh, it's that division, Christian, Muslim, everybody. It's just, uh, it's a melting pot, but it's also, uh, the oil is always separated. Very divided. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. <laughs> but but you, go, you go to the Basilica in Philadelphia, and what a beautiful church. And right. It's not a fortress. No. <laughs> and everything and else it's is. not what you what and everybody is armed everybody is armed right you know and again you don't know who the bad guys are which yeah it adds <laughs> that it's, it's that element of what am i doing did you ever did ever come a time where you, where you actually said to yourself what the hell am i doing here oh of course of course we would all uh talk about that and uh there's nothing i can do about it right just you just do our job get it done and deal with it just keep task at hand and yeah that's keep task at who's not going to change anything no. nothing is going to change exactly did, did you feel like you guys were making a difference or doing any kind of good over there at the I, time i do think we met it made a difference um 
let me elaborate a little bit. Uh, two years ago, I was at the uh, old Naval Air Station uh, outside of Ocean City, uh, or Wildwood, Rio Grande, I think was the name of the air station. And I was looking at a Cobra helicopter. And the guy next to me came up and says, yeah, he was a little boy, and I used to see these flying over Beirut. And I said, no kidding, when? And he told me, and I said, well, I was there. And he goes, oh, my God, thank you very much. He was an older man now. He, he brought his son over, introduced me to his son. He was an American citizen. He was going in the armed forces of the United States. And he goes, we appreciated what you guys did for us. So 40, what, 38 years later, yeah. I was like, wow. So, Because you know, you, know, you know what you're doing over there is something significant, but to put yourself in the eyes of the people who were living it every day, you know, it, it, it's a whole different meaning of thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and Beirut is not remembered very well. Um, my family obviously knows. Uh, my, my son-in-law and I are going to be going down to Camp Lejeune in October for the 40th remembrance of the, um, the attack at the, um, the barracks. And uh, I get, still get together with uh, 10, 15 of our, my buddies and we reflect on everything. And it's just good to see everybody. And it's, it takes you back 40 years. Like, you didn't skip a beat. Yeah, you you're where you're right off. where you left off. And, and it's such a great feeling. Absolutely. And if it wasn't for the internet, I, I would never have reconnected with these guys. Because you always say you're going to stay in touch and stay in touch, and y you never do. Right. And then the internet came along, Facebook. I reconnected with so many people through Facebook that um, it, it is such a great tool. I I, I loved it, man. And when you know when, when you've shared something, experiences like that with people, you can talk to say me about it, and I could say I understand it. Yeah, but you, you don't get it really. I'm, you know? I'm listening to you tell me your version of it. But when you sit around with a bunch of guys who were there with you, there, there's probably a lot that's it's unspoken. It doesn't need to be spoken, but it's understood. Yeah, yeah. I, I could just look at some of my friends, and they would know what I was thinking right away right. without without communicating any words. Sure, sure. <laughs> you, you find it you find it helpful to get together with these guys, um, it, therapeutic, um, in a way. Yeah, it, it brings back the past, and it's just friendships that existed for for such a long time. I mean, how many people remain friends over 40-some years? Right. You know? Absolutely. Um, other than the... So there, there was the, the, the embassy bombing and the, the couple... Of, is, is there a... If, if you have to think back to that time, and, and your mind goes back to that time, is there one incident that sticks out more than any other? That's when, when, you, when someone says Beirut or Marine Corps, your mind goes instantly to that, that incident or that time. Well, I, when you say that, instantly I go back to us being on patrol. Um, obviously the suicide bombing at the embassy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a point that sticks out in my mind, the, the adventures in the mountain, that rescue trip, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, you got to see much more of uh, Lebanon than just Beirut. Um, and in the beginning of May, I'm not sure the exact dates, maybe May 3rd through the 5th, maybe the 8th, there was really heavy exchanges of artillery and mortar fire in the mountains. And, um, you know, you, you see the tracers and rockets flying at night and all the colors. I mean, it's kind of crazy, but it's beautiful looking. But at the same time, it's death and destruction right. there. You know, and that always sticks out in my mind. I've and heard, getting yeah. on the helicopters and flying away was yeah. like R-46 lifted off the ground, going back to our ship, uh, USS Raleigh at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a spontaneous cheer inside the helicopter that you could hear over the roar of the rotor blades. Like, ah, ha, 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 we are out of here. here. You know, it's, that was such a, a cool feeling. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, to go back to what you said before about it being people, I've heard, I've heard a lot of veterans and guys who have been in areas where there's been artillery and firefights, and they, the word the, the word they use is is horrifyingly beautiful. Exactly. Where uh, whoever it's, stated it's those that two extremes it, it, that it are so head. opposite, but and and some some guys will say that they they will actually laugh because 
it's it's beautiful, but it's terrifying. And yeah, it you're you you're young, and, dumb. You're invincible. Yeah. You're I, 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 at Beirut. I was what twenty one, I think, at that time, and uh, you know nobody thought about. Uh, yeah, you <laughs> this could be end of lifetime experience right. here. You know, it's, it's the invincibility of youth. Right. You just put that in the back of your head. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so w when you went back, when you left Beirut, um, you, you went to your R and R in Key West. You're you're very good R and R, as you said. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> um, how long were you there? You said two weeks. Uh, for Key West, yeah. uh, I think we were there three or four days. Okay. And the reason why we went there because the Navy was required to have some kind of operations with their ships. Okay. But the Marines weren't essential for whatever the Navy was doing. Uh -huh. So we had nothing but free time. Gotcha. The Navy was a working visit, and they only got off at night. Okay. But we were, oh, we had the run of the place. And after being away from America for so long, it was it was a great time. Much, much needed and much deserved. Oh, much needed, yeah. yeah. Um, so when you got out, so you, how long, how long was your, your enlistment was? I was uh, four years active, and I stayed in the reserves another three years. Okay. So when you're, you're active time, so actually, let me, let me step back for a second for something you mentioned earlier. When you were back home and you were with your wife and you watched the, 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 uh, oh, the, the uh, embassy bombing. The, or the uh, barracks, the barracks bombing, bombing. I'm, I'm yeah, in the store. Did, did you have, did, did you have an, a, a feeling of, I need to go back, or I want to go back, or I should be back there? What I felt was that this was my Pearl Harbor. Okay. And I expected like a nationwide call up and us going to war to to put this to rest, so to speak. Uh, I really expected, you know, I had time on my uh, reserve time that you're getting called up, you're getting sent back, but it never happened. We didn't do anything. How and does I that make you feel. I really think that that set the tone for it emboldened the enemy to strike more against America. Because mm -hmm. I, I wasn't there, but I, I believe there was one naval airstrike against targets in the Lebanon immediately after the bombing. Mm -hmm. And I think we lost a few aircraft. But after that, I believe in February, the Marines were withdrawn. Basically, we gave up. And That's hard to do. That's hard it to it do. wasn't the, the troops. It right. was the government. Right basically said we don't want this headache whatever the reason was mm -hmm. um and i just think that caused all our problems in the 90s and 2000s mm -hmm. and <laughs> where we are today we still have people over there yeah. in the middle east do you remember where you were when you, you you saw the events of september 11th in 2001 i was a police officer in philadelphia mm -hmm. A University of Penn police and I had worked the night before and I had gotten home I had just crawled into bed uh, my wife called and said hey put the TV on something bad's happening like what are you talking about flipped on the TV got to see the second plane strike the building mm -hmm. I got a call a few minutes later from work get down here everybody's called back because we had no idea what was going on right um, they were evacuating every high-rise in the city of Philadelphia, and they needed everybody back. So I hadn't even got an hour's sleep after working a 10-hour tour. Right. Went back, you know, was on my feet, dragging my ass for... Uh, that was another blur. We did this for like two weeks, three weeks at a time. 12-hour days on and off, yep. and uh, fortunately, nothing ever happened after that, but right. we didn't know. Right. Everybody expected uh, something to happen mm -hmm. somewhere again. And when they shut down all the air traffic, who knows? Maybe there was other plans for uh, right. more more attacks. But then I, I thought, you know what? They got away with this one time. They will never take over an aircraft again because uh, people were going to fight back. Mm -hmm. it, up to that point, uh, when an airliner was taken, basically you got a negotiated right. settlement, right? Yep. Who would have thought that people would fly a plane into a building? You know, it was unthinkable. Which unthinkable. Is why nobody planned for it. No, yeah, right. And we, there was some wild intelligence from our time in Beirut too, of like terrorists uh, going to attack you in hang gliders and all this like crazy stuff. Right. Is that even possible? You know, you're thinking to yourself, yeah. and but but you never know. Right. You never know. So when you saw September 11th happen, did, did your mind go back to your time in Beirut? 
Well, did seeing, you, seeing the destruction, out? yeah. And um, one of my friends, Juan Rivero, was a Port Authority policeman. He was a Purple Heart winner in Beirut. Mm -hmm. And he was assigned to the Port Authority, and that was his area. Um, his partner died when it collapsed. Mm -hmm. And speaking to him on the phone, he was like, uh, you could feel the building coming down. And I just ran as hard as I could. And then the blast wave overtook me, and it threw him under a car, and the blast cloud went through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, other than scrapes and stuff like that, he wasn't hurt, but his partner is dead. Mm -hmm. And what kind of survivor guilt do you have there? I mean... There was a lot of that after. And, yeah, of course, he's got troubles, respiratory problems right, and everything right. now, but mm -hmm. it's absolutely horrible. H how has your time in, in Beirut and in the military affected your life? Well, I, I probably think about it every day. Um, I, like I said, at one point I think I was going to do the Marine Corps as a career, but um, I thought, you know what, uh, I don't want to be overseas all this time. I'd rather become a police officer, I think, and I probably spent more time away as a police officer <laughs> through various trainings than uh, if I was deployed. Worked many a holiday and weekends and, you know, round the clocks. Missed a lot of family events, but it's the nature of the job. Uh-huh, absolutely, absolutely. So obviously we're sitting here today and we're videotaping this interview. Um, so theoretically, 50, 70 years from now, maybe your great, great, great grandchildren <laughs> might be watching this video. If there was one thing you would want to tell your great, great, however many generations of grandkids, about your time in the service, what would that be? Uh, well, there are pluses and minuses to it, uh, but I think you get more uh, out of your experience than, than you would lose. And I do believe that uh, service, national service of some kind is good for the country. Um, so you, you, would, you would encourage young folks nowadays to, to enter military service? I don't know. Because I'm not in it right now, mm -hmm. but to me it looks like there's too much wokeness going on. And the ultimate mission of the military is to kill. And um, I, I just don't know. So how, how, does, know. how does a Marine who served in the, in the, in the 80s and the, in the 70s, how do, how do you come to grips with, with the modern military? I, I don't know because uh, obviously warfare is changing with all the drones and artificial intelligence and um, I think the, the enemy remains the same as you have to attack the threat and I don't think we're attacking the threat. Mm. Is there anything else that you'd like to document today that we haven't spoken about? Any other stories you'd like to tell or any other experiences? Uh, well, my major complaint with my military service is uh, they poisoned us with water at Camp Lejeune. Okay. Um, there was a dry cleaning plant that was dumping stuff out their back door. The fuel farm was leaking the aviation gas into the water table, and the industrial area was leaking stuff. And they knew about it, and they didn't do anything. They didn't shut the wells down. We didn't get notified until 20 some years after the fact. I had a whole bunch of unexplained health problems that we believe are attributed to the poison water, but you can't prove it. Mm -hmm. And now there's a bunch of conditions where it's presumptuous that, you know, I, I, I just felt betrayed that um, that was even allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. And everybody that worked in the water treatment plant at Camp Lejeune back in my day is dead. So that says something right Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And um, that's the biggest downfall is the water contamination. I Terribly disgusted at the whole thing. Felt betrayed by, by your guys. Felt betrayed and a lot of young guys, well, w when you're dying at 58, 59, that's, something's not right. Mm -hmm. You know, most people are living into well into their 70s now. So, and I'll, I'm 62 in November. I'm a cancer survivor also and uh, just is that from that? We don't know. Never will. And shame of it. Well, sir, I'd like to thank you very much for sitting down with me yeah, and speaking thank you. today. I'd like to thank you for your service. Thank you, Ed.